Hello and uh, welcome to St Paul's Online Talks. My name's Julia, I'm one of the licensed lay ministers at St Paul's in Chippenham. Through these talks we're hoping to cover all sorts of different topics. Some might be new to you, some might be a refresher, but hopefully it's all going to add into extending your understanding, your scripture knowledge and ultimately your faith. Please do let us know what you think, what's challenged you, what you've learnt and also let us know any topics you think we should cover through these online talks so we can carry on the conversations that we would normally be having face to face but through online means. This is a shorter version of the talk I gave at the start of our Lent series where we were looking at different aspects of Jesus' life in first century Israel. So this is about Jesus the Rabbi. So Jesus, as we know, was born into a Jewish family. When he was born, they presented two birds as a sacrifice when he was born. And it was a devout family. Like every other Jewish boy, Jesus was circumcised at eight days old. And in Luke's Gospel, we read that when Joseph and Mary had done everything required by the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee to their own town of Nazareth. And the child, that's Jesus, grew and became strong. He was filled with wisdom and the grace of God was on him. Luke also tells us that every year Jesus went up with his parents to Jerusalem for the festival of Passover. This wasn't a requirement in law to go every year, but they did so, which shows a sign of their devotedness to God to undertake the four or five day walk up to Jerusalem for the festival and then walk back. That's a big chunk of your annual holiday. Jesus would have grown up in and around the synagogue, participating in the annual festivals, as all young Jewish boys did, and learning the scriptures and teachings. He would have participated in the Passover, asking questions about the stories and the meanings and the history of the Jewish people. And Jesus continued to learn as he grew up and obviously proved himself in the strict disciplines of learning, because by the time he was an adult, in the Gospel of John, we read, the Jews were amazed at his teaching and began to ask, how did this man get such learning without having been taught? And Jesus explains as an adult that actually he, his wisdom came from God, but it also came from the time he'd spent with the rabbis and the other teachers of the law. It's in his home synagogue in Nazareth that Jesus opens the scroll of the Torah, that's the Jewish scriptures, and reads the passage from Isaiah that starts, The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me. Effectively, this is Jesus announcing the start of his ministry, aged about 30, as a rabbi. Fourteen times across the gospel, Jesus is called a rabbi. But it's one of those words that sometimes we think we know what it means. But actually, let's just look at that a little bit more. A rabbi would usually have started their full ministry at about the age of 30. They'd be fully trained in the scriptures and they would set out on their own. Often rabbis were common workers practising a trade to cover their costs. There was a rabbinic saying which said, he who makes a profit from the words of the Torah has brought about his own destruction. So Jesus was probably an itinerant carpenter like his father or a builder of some sort. Rabbis spent their spare time when they weren't working, travelling round, teaching in synagogues and remote areas, in houses, under trees. And they would have been dependent on other people's hospitality. We see that Jesus went and ate meals at different people's houses, such as Martha and Mary. And a rabbi's main mission was to teach their interpretation of the Torah, both teaching it and living it out, and to raise up disciples to carry on that teaching. One of the things that marked them out was their clothing. So I've, I was lent by one of our, um, by Ken from church, thank you Ken, uh, a prayer shawl. This is a, a Jewish prayer shawl that he picked up in Israel. And on the end, there's the blue cloth, but you can see there are some tassels. In Numbers, in the book of Numbers, in chapter 15, it, the Lord said to Moses, speak to the Israelites and say to them, Throughout the generations to come, you are to make tassels on the corner of your garments with a blue cord on each tassel. You will have these tassels to look at, and so you will remember the commands of the Lord, that you may obey them and not prostitute yourselves by chasing after the lusts of your own hearts and eyes. Then you will remember to obey all my commands and be consecrated to your God, 
I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Israel, of, out of Egypt into Israel to be your God. I am the Lord your God. So wearing a prayer shawl, a cloak with these tassels on the end, would have been an outward show of trying to be obedient to the laws of God. It's a bit like the reminder I have when I wear my cross. It's an outward sign of something internal going on. If you turn, if you've got a Bible, have a look at chapter five in Mark, in the Gospel of Mark. It says a large crowd followed Jesus and pressed around him. And a woman was there who'd been subject to bleeding for about 12 years. She suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and spent all that she had. Yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak because she thought, if I just touch his clothes, I will be healed. Immediately, her bleeding stopped and she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. At once, Jesus realised that power had gone out from him. He turned around in the crowd and asked, who touched my clothes? You see the people crowding round you, his disciples answered, and yet you asked, who touched me? But Jesus kept looking round to see who'd done it. Then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet and trembling with fear, told him the whole truth. He said to her, daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. This woman was unclean, both medically and spiritually. The purity laws in the Old Testament that we can read, especially in Leviticus, were there to maintain public health as much as anything. This woman had been bleeding for 12 years, which in her car culture made her an outcast, unclean. She was desperate. She'd gone everywhere else first, which left her penniless. And perhaps she came to God as a last resort. We don't know where she got her faith from. Maybe it was superstition. Maybe she'd seen or heard something about who Jesus was and what he was capable of. But this was a massive act of faith for this woman. For a rabbi, indeed for anyone, coming into contact with the unclean was against all the Jewish laws and her touching someone would have made that person unclean as well. If this sick woman had reached out to anyone else, they would have become sick. The contamination would have spread from her to the next person. Does that sound familiar in these strange times that we're in today? And yet, when the woman touches Jesus, although in our translation it says she touched his cloak, the word in Hebrew is for those tassels. The woman touches the most sacred part of the cloak, the tassels, the bit that was the outward show of Jesus' faith in God. The woman touches the holiest part of Jesus' garment. It seems quite a little thing. She reached out and touched his cloak, but it had big results. Jesus shares the pollution of sick and death, but through the power of his love, he turns it into wholeness and hope. Jesus' purity was so great that it healed her impurity. He, he restores not just the woman's health, but her self-respect, her place in community, and most of all, she comes to know Jesus personally. Are you holding on to faith by your fingertips? Have you got just enough faith to reach out through your pain to Jesus? Are you ready to reach out and trust what he can do? In Psalm 24, it says, Who may ascend the mountain of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? The one who has clean hands and a pure heart. I think at the moment, my hands are possibly the cleanest they've been for a long time. But joking aside, will we ever have clean enough hands and a pure enough heart to stand before God? However, like with the woman, she was unclean. And Jesus had the power and love to cleanse and heal her. So it is with us. Jesus had the power and love to cleanse and heal our hands, our hearts, so that we can, in truth, stand before him.